you or someone you love have scoliosis? Are you wondering what's next? What is life going to be like from now on? Or is this even a big deal? Hi, my name is Dave Butler, and welcome to the Scoliosis Experience. We are here to talk with real people, both patients, parents, and providers, to bring hope and clarity to the road ahead. Thanks for joining us, and let's get started. Hello and welcome to today's podcast. Today I talked to Skylar, who is a student at Leslie University studying drama therapy. She provides some amazing insights into scoliosis, shares her story about her own scoliosis and the struggles that she had with it. One of the cool things that Skylar brings to this podcast is the perspective of a drama therapist. She gives some great insights into her own struggles with scoliosis and how she dealt with those. And over the past year, we've been working with Leslie University to develop a good way to deal with and treat and help people get over the psychological aspect of scoliosis. So her insights into this are really cool. Uh, I really enjoyed talking with Skylar. She had some some good insights and her story is is definitely one that others can learn from and others can see uh, ways to navigate their own scoliosis. Hopefully you enjoy it as much as I did. Here's Skylar. Welcome to the podcast. I'm sitting here with Skylar. I'm technically not sitting here with Skylar. We're on Zoom, so she is uh, far away from here, but uh, I thought I'd do a good a good podcast episode with Skylar. I, I met Skylar on Zoom, actually. We've only interacted on Zoom. She's working with uh, my brother, who is a drama therapist in Boston at Leslie University. And she has some experience with scoliosis, and we've been working with their their team a bit, developing something for scoliosis and the, the psychological side of scoliosis. So Thank you for being here, Skylar, and kind of introduce yourself a little bit. Sure. Yes. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for having me. My name is Skylar Stratemeyer. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm speaking to you today from South Florida. Um, and yeah, I'm entering into my final year of my master's program at Leslie University. I'm studying clinical mental health counseling with a specialization in drama therapy um, with the hopes of becoming a registered drama therapist in the future. Fantastic. And I didn't know you're in Florida. That's, that's pretty cool. You have better weather. It's actually snowed today here in Utah. So tell us your experience with scoliosis. You know, what, what makes you someone that knows about scoliosis? Definitely. Um, So I live with scoliosis and I found out about my diagnosis by accident. It was actually literally an accident that took place where I had fractured my tailbone I was about 10 years old. I went down a slide at a jungle gym and landed not so ideally. Um, My parents took me to a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and after an evaluation and x-rays, the doctor comes back and says, yeah, you fractured your tailbone, but wait, there's more. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Exactly. Um, That's when I learned that I had both scoliosis and spondylolisthesis. And so on top of this, when I was born, um, they discovered I had spina bifida. And so that was discovered when I was a newborn, thanks to having a diligent uh, registered nurse practitioner of a mom who noticed a dimple that shouldn't have been there. Um, Thankfully, the spina bifida was nothing more than the dimple uh, seemed to be low risk. But now flash forward to being 10 years old and having fractured my tailbone and learning about these two other scary S sounding spine conditions. um, It was a lot to carry at 10 years old. And so my experience with scoliosis has always been tied up in this amalgamation of other things and comorbidities. But at the time that it was coming to light, I had been put on eight weeks of complete bed rest, was in a back brace for about six months, lots of physical therapy and lots of visits to the doctor. Wow, that, that's a lot to take in as a 10-year-old. Definitely. A um, lot to take in. That's kind of an early diagnosis for scoliosis as well. Do you know how big the curve was at the time? 
It, yeah, definitely was a surprise. The curve was, has always been mild, but I remember just this urgency around how young I was and the fact that, you know, our bodies are changing and growing and spines are moving. Um, and so there was just this uh, urgency around what would happen as I continued to grow if we didn't uh, stay on top of it. That if I see a 10 year old with even mild scoliosis, the problem is you have a long time to grow and that growth can, can make progression. So, so you did physical therapy, you did, you know, visits to the doctor. Did you have a tailbone fracture or was it the spondylolisthesis that you were, that you were getting treated for? Um, I recovered from the fracture within those first six months about, and then it was really the spondylolisthesis and the scoliosis that I was continuing to go to the doctor to have them measure the degree and continue up with x-rays. Um, there was a lot of fear of bones slipping and severity of curves increasing. So that was that continued on through my early adolescence. Kind of a scary thing for a 10 year old and 12, 13 year old to think about your spine slipping. I mean, that's not something that most 10 year olds are worried about. No. Yeah. And there was, there were actually lots of things that I had never considered before that at the time that the scoliosis diagnosis came to light was kind of being thrown at me um, all at once. You know, it, it's like with being so young with the knowledge that our bodies are changing, you know, and doctors need to acknowledge the worst case scenarios. And so things like if I didn't do X, Y, and Z immediately, then there was this looming threat of losing mobility in the future or becoming paralyzed when I hit puberty or even not being able to bear children into adulthood. Um, and I was 10 when I received news like this. Wow. Um, and I definitely carried that for a long time. And there was absolutely this significant emotional experience happening alongside the physical pain um, and the ambiguity of just my wellness in the future. And I guess the hard thing is you, you had a mild curve, which could have progressed to a, a larger curve, but it, I mean, you don't have a severe curve now and you didn't have to have scoliosis surgery and things like that. Correct. Right. Um, I have been extremely yeah. fortunate. I was able to receive care and follow the recommendations of my doctors, uh, maintain my treatment and really just learned how to take care of my body, learned how to move in ways that felt comfortable for me and how to protect and strengthen my spine. And so, yeah, at 25 years old, I, I think I'm doing okay. <laughs> that's, that's great. I move around just fine. Um, I don't really consider myself to have any real physical limitations or restraints. And my back pain today mostly serves as a reminder that I'm slouching. So. Ah, um, yes. Our but bodies definitely, <laughs> we definitely get talked to by our bodies, right? That they tell oh, us what we need to be doing. Yes. The body will communicate its needs. Um, yes, definitely. But it, so, it so how would you say that being diagnosed at, I mean it's just not it's not just scoliosis that you were diagnosed with at that time there are multiple things but how did that affect your life at that time and and going forward in maybe different aspects than just having to go to physical therapy yeah so the the initial impact of receiving the news that I had scoliosis um, along with these other diagnoses it was definitely tough I look back at that time in my life and it was really surrounded with fear and uncertainty um, about the future. And then there was, you know, the sense of urgency and needing to do things right now or else. And yeah, things I hadn't ever thought about before, like being a mother or, you know, that I, 10 years old, never considered that. And even the concept of it, let alone the fact that it might not be an option for me in the future and but I was so busy with going to treatment 
you know, not bending the wrong way and being so careful about my physical health that um, I hadn't put a lot of mind to what was happening emotionally. And, and you know, and I think it, it catches up eventually. And so then moving into high school, I had kind of, I'd reached this point where I was medically stable, um, but was still living with kind of this residual fear and even resistance toward being in my body, moving in certain ways. There was, it, I felt like I was kind of tiptoeing around mm. every day, everywhere. It was this interesting feeling that was left over. Right. Like, like you said, medically, you were, you're okay. Medically, you were quote unquote fine, but that's, that's not all of it. You know, that's, that's not the whole, the whole story. And I think sometimes with scoliosis and other medical problems, we look at, okay, medically, you're doing great. You should be doing, you should be doing fine. And that's not always the case. Right. It's, um, it's tough to consider all the other things that happen simultaneously. And I I think that it's so tough in in the medical model, how there's not always that much space for the the mental or emotional or um, just the socio-emotional development and that it it plays such a large role in in our overall wellness and health. And so it's really, it's really nice to see doctors like you, Dave, who, who consider the emotional experiences of patients too. And I I think that, you know, in, in my future, I hope to offer therapy services. And I acknowledge the fact that ethically I couldn't ever treat anything within the medical model, um, any like broken bones. And and so we, we stay in our lanes, but I think moving forward, it's really about working together and kind of viewing patients and clients as, as whole people and seeing in what other services can be referred to or what other resources we could offer or recommend. Right. And I think like you were saying, we stay in our lanes. I don't pretend to know how to do drama therapy. You know, that's not my, my wheelhouse, but knowing that it's there and knowing Mm -hmm. how to maybe help someone hit the off ramp to go to that lane, (laughs) you know, or, or something like that. I think is really where I want to go because I mean, I don't want to go back to school and learn how to do drama therapy as fun as that would be, but knowing how to integrate that into our treatment plan, I think medical, medical treatment specifically has been very, very stuck in their lane. And I think we can do a better job at that. So maybe tell us a little bit about drama therapy, kind of what it is, how maybe you used it with your own, your own problems that you had? Sure. So drama therapy is the intentional use of theater techniques to meet therapeutic goals. It can look like a lot of different things. It fits into many different spaces, but ultimately at its core, uh, drama therapy uses tools like projection, embodiment, storytelling, roles, and play uh, to promote socio-emotional wellness, personal growth, and a sense of community. And so in response to if I've used it to support my experiences with scoliosis, um, I would say yes and no. Mm. Um, <laughs> it's like when, when the body experiences chronic pain, when the body is injured or becomes a hurtful or not nice place to be, then we tend to want to mentally step out of it. Um, or disconnect from the body. But with drama therapy, um, it offers these distanced and kind of titrated ways of re-engaging with the body in ways that feel manageable. And so really my understanding of and the application of drama therapy in my own life has served me in ways where it's promoted that mind-body connection it's helped me find those entry points of coming back and kind of making home in my body again. So while I haven't directly applied it to my experience with scoliosis, just knowing of it and the exposure to drama therapy has definitely indirectly supported my personal relationship with my body and 
my view and acceptance of myself. Yeah, so it sounds like you haven't been formally treated in drama therapy for for that, uh, but those principles you've probably been able to apply to yourself. Absolutely. Uh, so the drama therapy is, is something that, I mean, I, I was exposed to a little bit with my brother being a drama therapist, but I think a lot of people don't know what you guys do. And so I, I appreciate you giving us an idea of what drama therapy is. I get asked that a lot when, because I talk about my brother, Jason, a, a bit with patients right. and they're like, what, what is drama therapy? I mean, it sounds interesting, but what actually is it? So that's helpful for people to know. Yeah. Do you feel like drama therapy is a good fit for those who have some psychological trauma from maybe going further through the process of scoliosis, bracing, surgery, um, you know, things like that. And maybe not just adolescents, but adults that may have it kind of maybe touch on that a little. Yeah, uh, definitely. Great question. I, I do. I, I do think drama therapy could be helpful for those struggling with the diagnosis of scoliosis and um, the things that come along with living with it. Mainly everyone's experience of their diagnosis and the impact of it are so uniquely different, right? Um, I recognize that my story might not sound anything like another individual's story where they share their experiences um, living with maybe the same exact diagnoses as me. But drama therapy works in ways that it, it can meet individuals wherever they're at. And it can be designed and modified to meet specific or emerging physical or emotional needs. Um, and I definitely recognize that there's an emotional component to living with scoliosis. And I believe that drama therapy could be used as a vehicle to hold and explore, illuminate, or even transform some of these experiences that people are living with, with scoliosis in ways that can be tailored to and serve that individual, definitely. That's one thing that I've noticed is I've heard more about it. It's like, it's pretty versatile. Drama therapy is very, it's not just, you know, you go in and you act in a play. It's, there's a quite a bit of depth to it. So it seems like not just scoliosis patients, but chronic pain patients. That's actually why I reached out to, to Jason and we got involved with Leslie University with chronic pain. I was frustrated with not being able to treat the whole aspect of chronic pain. Some people that just wouldn't get better and it seemed like medically they were doing better. Right. There's definitely um, a link between our perception of pain and our emotional experience and the way we're coping and processing it. And yeah, I, I think that's why I love drama therapy so much. It can be molded um, to be whatever it needs to be in that moment to, um, to meet the needs or hold or support that individual with where they're at in their journey um, in relationship to their body, their emotions, the world. Um, there's not like a, a one size fits all treatment for living with scoliosis or chronic back pain and drama therapy acknowledges that we can't you know we we need to be flexible and and we have uh, a whole repertoire of different tools and interventions that um, can be used when needed and as appropriate and so it yeah I think it could be a, a good fit <laughs> for yeah. people with scoliosis and chronic back pain definitely. I'm curious, how, how did you decide on drama therapy? Like, what was your exposure to it? Or just wondering how you came to want to do that? Definitely. Um, so I was actually always a theater kid in high school. Mm -hmm. um, I studied theater for my bachelor's degree and kind of like in a hallway conversation, passing by, heard about this concept of drama therapy and didn't know what it was and went home and Googled it quickly and mm -hmm. learned a little more about it and realized that that was something I wanted to learn more about because my, my teenage years, I really just dove headfirst into theater and I, I found it to be so 
so transformative. Um, and it really, really touched me and moved me in ways that made me find my voice and love myself and want to be a part of this bigger community and, and finding out that theater elements are being used intentionally in the clinical setting for therapeutic goals. I was like, yeah, that's for me. I, I believe in that. So I, I want to be a part of it. <laughs> it sounds like theater was before you were in drama therapy, drama was therapeutic for you. 100%. Yeah, during that time of your life when we already talked about the struggles, the stuff that you had to think about when you were 10, which normally 10 year olds aren't thinking about those things. That was probably a good escape, maybe not an escape, but definitely a good therapy for you. Yeah, it was um, something to channel my feelings into or definitely an, an outlet for expression for me. Um, right. That's cool. If someone is listening to this who also has kind of that same desire that you had to, to go into that profession, what, what does it take to become a trauma therapist? Great question. Um, <laughs> there are, yeah, I think really logistically um, the requirements to get into a program that, that offers training in drama therapy would be a, a bachelor's in psychology or even theater. I, I came from a 100% theater background um, mm -hmm. and got accepted. And so yeah, an, an interest in psychology um, and theater. And there are only a handful of programs here in North America that offer the training in drama therapy. Um, Leslie University is one, and I'm definitely biased as I go there and have really loved my experience. Um, but I would definitely encourage those who are interested to, to look into it and yeah, pursue um, what they can, where they can. There's also the North American Drama Therapy Association, um, the NADTA, they hold conferences and you can check out their website and um, learn more. Awesome. And the drama therapy degree is a master's degree, correct? Yeah, you would get a master's in either one of the programs that offer drama therapy, or I believe that you could just get a master's in clinical mental health and then reach out to the NADTA and um, see what additional trainings or hours they would require to get registered. Interesting. Okay, cool. Well, hopefully that helps someone that is looking, that has the same passion that you do about this. I think that's, that's really cool. What advice would you have for someone, say someone that's diagnosed at 10 years old, kind of like, kind of like you were, or maybe even a little bit later, uh, what advice would you give to them? Hmm. My advice um, to someone who is just diagnosed young or old I think I, I would tell them really to just hold on to hope um, in whatever capacity they can. Maybe don't be so quick to abandon your dreams of the type of future that you want for yourself, even if in the moment it might feel bleak or scary. It might not be an easy road, but all of the work that you put into your treatment, your physical therapy, and all the things you do to take care of your spine and your body and your mind um, is ultimately for you. And even if it's scary or exhausting at times, I, I think you should do it because you know that you deserve to live a healthy and a comfortable life and uh, to reach like a, a state of equilibrium in your body. But for someone who's lived with it for many years, I'm not sure if I'd have advice. I think I'd, I'd be more interested in learning what advice they would have to share with me, maybe, um, as I continue on my journey living with scoliosis. Right. You've lived with it for 15 years, but yeah, they're different. I have patients that are in their 80s and 90s with scoliosis. They might, they might have a little different advice. Who knows? Yeah, I'm hoping there's still a, a long road ahead for me. <laughs> right. I'm sure, I'm sure there is. It sounds like you got a pretty good handle on it. So I, I think that's great. You were talking about you know, holding on to hope and holding on to not abandoning your dreams. 
for for the future. Is that something that you feel like happened when you were 10, maybe 11, that you started to rethink things that you wanted to do in your life? Yeah, at the age of 10, I was really surrounded by all these catastrophizing ideas of the future. And it definitely altered some of the things I felt like I could do or couldn't do um, at the time. Not even just as far as physical abilities, but um, I don't know what what I was capable of in my future and what what I could manage. Um, I think in, in retrospectively, I didn't give up the fact that I I didn't give up this idea of, of, of a fulfilled life, even if the doctors were telling me that all these things could possibly go wrong. Yeah, and it it wasn't easy. I had to fight to hold on to this hope of of a healthy, comfortable future um, at times. But ultimately, I think it's what pulled me through was that that I, I'm I am capable and I I can get through this even if it's not easy, and I'll, I'll make it to the other side in, in a way that um, feels right for me. You know. Right. Yeah. Sounds like quite the learning experience for a, a young teenager. That has yeah, to go through that. <laughs> this continued all throughout my teen years. And, you know, even I still reflect on the things that happened to me and, and how it, it sits with me today. But um, ultimately, I think hope got me through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and hopefully you're still learning. Hopefully we're all, we're all still learning as we deal with those things. Yeah, back when when you were doing physical therapy and other treatments, I would imagine they weren't anything technically specific to scoliosis, like a, a specific technique. Like at my clinic, we do the Schroth method for scoliosis from Germany, things like that. Did you feel like the treatment that you got back then was specific to your curve or specific to scoliosis, or was it hard to find something like that? Um, it was tough to find services that felt tailored to all of my individual needs. Yes, um, my parents, they worked really hard to try to find like the, the leading team of doctors and specialists here in South Florida that they could bring me to. And yeah. I was really fortunate to receive you know, insight from these professionals in the field. But yeah, we, we didn't, I didn't really, it was, my physical therapy mostly consisted of ways to move or not move Mm -hmm. kind of stretches um, to strengthen the spine, but I needed to really modify as I went um, through physical therapy. It was kind of a trial and error process from what I can recall. There are so many variables um, at the time. Right. Yeah, I, I would be curious to see what um, the services would look like today instead of 15 yeah. years ago and, and how they've improved or just been modified to be tailored more easily for individual needs. Yeah, and 15 years ago, I mean, the Schroth Method exercise program wasn't really wasn't really in the U.S. It, it was just barely starting to be in the U.S. And so it wasn't really an option at that time. I feel like the way that we treat scoliosis, well, the way that I treat scoliosis is quite a bit different than what I did even, you know, seven or eight years ago. Would that, do you feel like that would have helped with some of this if you felt like who was treating you really had a a good understanding and a a specific way of treating that? Maybe take some of the fear out of that? Definitely. I think with the advancements in the the increase in understanding of these different methods and their um, efficacy, I think that, you know, retrospectively, hopefully having a doctor who was so secure in this method that they were using was so certain of it, or at least believed in it. Yeah, I think that would reduce some of the fear and ambiguity. And there would have been maybe a 
a stronger container to hold my experiences in my scoliosis treatment. Right. So, so let's say someone wants to contact you to learn more about drama therapy or, or something along those lines. How would, how would they contact you? Yeah, um, I'd love to share my email address if anyone wanted to learn more about drama therapy or share anything that came up for them while they listened. Um, would love to hear people's thoughts or reflections. So awesome. could definitely get in touch with me via my Leslie email, which is S-S-T-R-A-T-E-M at leslie.edu. And how do you spell Leslie? That's L-E-S-L-E-Y. Okay, leslie.edu, awesome. And I, I think people listening to this will, this will be really beneficial, especially on that fear and psychological side of, of the diagnosis. I appreciate you sharing your experience with us. Yeah, I, I appreciate you asking and those who've listened. I, I think it's it's important to have these conversations about the other other things that emerge and it, you know, it's, there's always more bubbling up underneath the surface and there's definitely a, an emotional experience and there shouldn't be any stigma or shame around that. I, I think we should openly voice how we feel so we can find support when and where we need it. I totally agree with you. Totally agree. So thank you, Skylar and yeah. uh, good luck in the rest of rest of your education. You're, when do you graduate from drama therapy? May 2023, I'll be graduating. So oh, that's exciting. One year left to go. If there's anyone in South Florida that needs a good drama therapist, <laughs> they'll, yes. they'll, they'll know where to go. In just one year, you can be contacting me. <laughs> there you go. Well, cool. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you.